Hello, AP Environmental, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Environmental Systems. So, this will be a very quick story, so gather around the pond, my little tadpoles, as we venture into Environmental Systems. All right, energy flow and feedback. So, by the end of this video, you should be able to distinguish among various forms of energy and understand how, um, how they're measured and discuss the first and second laws of thermodynamics and explain how they influence environmental systems. So, the physics side of environmental systems um, and explain how scientists keep track of energy and matter inputs, outputs, and changes to environmental systems. Now, energy flows within and among systems. Plants and other photosynthetic organisms like algae that we talked about in the uh, Mono Lake absorb energy and use it in photosynthesis to convert um, carbon dioxide and water into sugars that they need to survive, grow, and also reproduce. Um, animals like those brine shrimp we talked about, brine shrimp, um, they eat plants and um, energy is transferred to them from the plant material. So when migrating gulls uh, use Mono Lake as a stopover, they consume these brine shrimp um, and transfer that energy into nutrients in inside of their bodies. And some transfers occur more effectively than others. <laughs> some transfers occur within a given system, while others, like those migrating gulls, um, they result in transfers of material from energy to other systems as well because they move. And so Earth's systems cannot function and organisms cannot survive without energy. And at its very whole, energy is the ability to do work uh, or transfer heat. Water flowing into a lake has energy because it moves and it can move other objects in its path. All living systems, they absorb energy from their surroundings and they use it to organize and reorganize molecules within their cells to power their, their movement. Uh, humans, like other animals, we absorb energy and we need it for cellular respiration. Uh, we absorb it in the form of food. Uh, this provides the energy for all of our daily activities. The basic unit of energy um, when the, in the metric system is what we call a joule. And that is the unit, it's a capital J. A joule is the amount of energy used in one watt um, of a light bulb turned on for one second. It's a very small amount. So although we often use the word energy and power interchangeably, they are not the same thing. So to clarify, we have seen that energy is the ability to do work and power is the rate at which work is done. So the formula for power is power equals energy divided by time. And in order to get energy, that's power multiplied by time. And when we talk about generating electricity, uh, we often hear about kilowatts and kilowatt hours. So the kilowatt, or KW, is a unit of power, while the kilowatt hour is a unit of energy. So therefore, the capacity of a turbine in a given kilowatt um, is a measurement which refers to the actual turbine's power. So your monthly electric bill reports the energy that you used and the amount of energy from electricity um, that you have used in, in your home is measured in a kilowatt. And since a kilowatt is a unit of power, it is technically your power bill, not your energy bill. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Unless you're being billed in, in time, so technically it would be your energy bill if it was your kilowatt hours. All right, so here we can see some common units of energy and their conversions. A calorie is equal to 4.18 joules, and um, a kilocalorie is 1,000 calories, uh, which reminds me that you, um, your food, like your granola bar, which has 140 calories, it's actually 140,000 calories. Your granola bar and human food labels, those are actually, uh, it's, a, it's a bad unit. Like It's actually a kilocalorie. Um, and BTUs, I still see a lot of BTUs, that's actually um, 1,055 joules. And so a lot of this you see on, on energy saving material that you buy like refrigerators and air conditioners and stuff like that. All right, and so um, 
So lastly here, we have the kilowatt hours, and you can see that in also appliances. It's on the little yellow label that uh, is on the side of your washing machines and dryers and refrigerators when you go to buy them. But anywho, uh, so there is a difference between all of this terminology. So energy exists in different forms, and it can be converted from one form to another. Potential energy, kinetic energy, light energy, chemical energy, and sound energy are all important types of energy forms in, in any environmental system. So ultimately, the most of the energy on Earth is derived from the sun, and the sun emits what we call electromagnetic radiation, which is a form of energy that includes, but it's not limited to, visible light, ultraviolet light, and infrared light, which we perceive as actually heat. <laughs> so... Uh, this shows that there's lots of different types of electromagnetic radiation uh, that we'll talk about here again in a second. And so electromagnetic radiation specifically is carried by photons. And those are, those are little tiny packets um, of energy that are travel uh, through this at the speed of light. And they can move even through a vacuum and space. And the amount of energy contained in a photon depends on its wavelength. The distance between the two peaks of that wave. So if I were to have like a wave right here, um, the energy admitted is uh, peak to peak, right? Wavelength. And so the amount of energy contained in that photon is just going to depend upon that actual wavelength. Photons with long wavelengths, such as like radio waves, they have a very low energy, while those with short wavelengths, like x-rays, they have a high energy. And photons of different wavelengths are used by humans in many different purposes. Uh, high energy and short wavelength x-rays are used to diagnose like medical medical things, and um, long, long, long wavelengths, the like infrared waves, you know, those can actually be used for um, identify uh, water leaks, or um, heat loss in certain buildings. But anyway, they all have their own purpose. And so stationary objects, they possess a large amount of potential energy. That's an energy that is stored, but it has not yet been released. And potential energy stored in a chemical bond is also known as its chemical energy. And that's the energy uh, that should sound uh, familiar to you because you know it's stored within food and by breaking down the high energy bonds inside of a salad that you just ate for lunch your body obtains energy uh, to power its activities and function just like an automobile engine when it combusts gasoline it releases energy from that chemical bond to propel the car we notice that water impounded behind a dam uh, contains a great deal of potential energy. And when water is released from that dam and starts to flow downstream, that potential energy now becomes kinetic energy, energy in motion. And ultimately, uh, to create electricity, you have to think of needing energy in motion. Uh, hopefully you can think of a lot of other common examples about different types of potential and kinetic energy.